In the mid-2000s, Neuromancer appears to have passed into the hands of a smaller, independent company called Seven Arts, run by producer Peter Hoffman. Once more, the timeline is not easy to sort out. Hoffman's name sometimes appears in connection with the earlier Alliance Films production, and it's rumored that his company was also behind the Chris Cunningham version. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to confirm any of this. Still other reports date Seven Arts' involvement sometime between 2006 and 2008. However, it happened, Neuromancer was apparently being set up at Hoffman's company as a large, independent production, budgeted around 60 or 70 million dollars. Another music video director, Joseph Kahn, who had made his feature debut with the 2004 biker action movie Torque, was hired around 2006 or 2007. Storyboard artist Dan Fraga posted artwork from the production to his blog in 2011, showing off early plans for a few of the film's action scenes. Hayden Christensen was rumored to be playing the lead around 2008. Two years later, the movie was abruptly scrapped and production started over. Vincenzo Natali was announced as Neuromancer's new director in 2010. A former storyboard artist, who apparently contributed uncredited work on Johnny Mnemonic, Natali started making his own films in 1997. His first feature, Cube, was a micro-budget sci-fi horror film cleverly designed to make the most of its minuscule resources. Essentially set in a single, endlessly repeating room, Natali used careful camera angles, lighting changes, and sound design to convincingly suggest his characters were trapped in an infinite and hellish labyrinth. Natali's subsequent films were built around equally inventive concepts. He continued working low budget until 2009, when he directed the sci-fi thriller Splice. Although a financial disappointment, the film's creepy and persuasive effects, bringing to life the genetically engineered central character, caught the attention of most reviewers. Natali started putting together several larger projects. In addition to Neuromancer, there were adaptations of J.G. Ballard's High Rise and Stephen King's It, a remake of Swamp Thing, and an entry in the Predator franchise. Natali posted artwork and script pages from these abandoned productions to his Twitter page in 2015. Of these, Neuromancer seems to have spent the longest in development. The film officially entered pre-production in 2011 as a Canadian-European co-production. Natali wrote a screenplay which apparently met with Gibson's approval and a large portfolio of striking concept art was assembled. The director in interviews expressed a desire to avoid making something too conventional. The structure and style of the original novel allowed for something more adventurous, and Natali was keen to take advantage of this in his adaptation. In 2012, Lorenzo de Bonaventura joined as a producer, and parts were offered to Mark Wahlberg and Liam Neeson. Natali's Neuromancer might have come closer to actually happening than any other version of the film. Sadly, the money just never seemed to materialize. No further progress could be made, and about two years later, De Bonaventura left the film. Shortly afterward, in 2015, it was confirmed that Natali had dropped out as well. The property traded hands, and the search for funding continued without a director. It was reported that C2M Media, a Chinese company, was going to finance the film, but no further updates were heard until 2017, when the production suddenly turned up at Fox with Deadpool director Tim Miller attached. That production, too, soon went quiet. Interest in Gibson's work seemed to be drying up. There hadn't been any new adaptations of his story since New Rose Hotel. Neuromancer had been all but eclipsed by the popular franchises it had inspired, and the author's most recent fiction was leaving cyberpunk behind to explore other styles. In 2022, the pattern of misfortune was finally broken. The Peripheral, an Amazon streaming series based on Gibson's 2014 novel, was the first major adaptation of his work in almost 25 years. Set in a bleak near future, the story follows a young woman drawn into a complex conspiracy. After discovering that a mysterious virtual reality game is actually a link to an even more bleak distant future, it wasn't cyberpunk, but the book marked something of a return to Gibson's particular style of high-concept sci-fi. The adaptation is high on intrigue and a little excessively action-driven. It doesn't quite preserve the author's startling imagery or his dry humor. However, it makes a real effort to engage 
engage with his ideas in ways that modern viewers might be more likely to connect with. Appropriately enough, Vincenzo Natali was an executive producer and director on the show. The Peripheral isn't a great adaptation, but it certainly helped introduce Gibson's work to a wider and younger audience, and its success appears to have opened up a new course for Neuromancer. In late 2022, Apple TV Plus announced plans to adapt the book as their own streaming series. Miles Teller is supposedly the frontrunner for the lead role, and the show is set to begin production this summer. Now that we've reached the end, I'm sorry to say this is another one of those projects where the story of its lifespan doesn't leave us with a real conclusion. At least not yet. It's still too early to say anything about the Apple TV series, and the way things have gone in the past, it could easily wind up being yet another version we never end up seeing. Right now, the timing looks good. The peripheral has been renewed for a second season, Gibson's books are attracting fresh interest, and Cyberpunk is enjoying a lot of prominence in popular culture thanks to successful games like Cyberpunk 2077. So we might have a good chance of seeing Neuromancer brought to life on screen within the next few years. If not, it probably won't be the last we hear of it. Neuromancer is too good and too important a book to ever go away.